Hello, I'm Alan Lee. Welcome to our series of election programmes covering issues that we believe are central to the health and well-being of all New Zealanders. We started this series by discussing how well we're doing in caring for our children. Then we talked about how well our education system prepares our children for their role in society. We've discussed the role of the welfare system, whether it's actually helping or hindering the people it was originally designed to protect. And we've talked about the law. How do we legislate effective boundaries and help people understand that there are consequences for antisocial behaviour? This week it's the big one. We're tackling the economy. How much does it cost the government to look after its citizens? And my guest is Business and Economic Research Limited economist from Wellington, Dr Ganesh Nana. Ganesh, thank you so much for joining us on the programme. I, I guess the, the big question is what should the government pay for? What are its responsibilities? Well, that's a big, big question, <laughs> isn't it? Um, According to the textbook, the economy is supposed to look after itself. It's supposed to run itself, and that's that market mechanism that no doubt many of, you viewers, many of your viewers would have heard about. Unfortunately, the textbook is, is nowhere near what happens in the real world. And uh, the, the prime role for government is, is sort of as the referee in the rugby game, is, is to make sure, is to, is to write the rules and then make sure people abide by those rules, whether those rules are how people set up business and, and how they um, sell goods and services or what, what are the minimum standards required for them to sell these sorts of things and um, what are the rules and regulations for them to enter into business. But I suppose that, that, that's sort of the, the textbook version of the government's role. But I think more broadly, um, and looking much more longer term, I suppose the, the government has a, a much more of a leadership role to actually set the, the environment for doing business, but also setting the environment to how the economy is going to develop over the long term. Are we developing into um, f focusing on industries or jobs that are going to provide um, good paying jobs, high skill jobs to, to bring up children and bring up families or are we um, specialising in something else and it's, and it's that sort of more longer term leadership role that, that unfortunately we, seems to go amiss when people concentrate on the, on the textbook. So should the government not be providing the sort of direct intervention that it does now in, in that it's providing a, a welfare state, it's paying for health, it's paying for education? Well, again, the, the welfare state one is, is very much around the, the providing the safety net for the, uh, the, the, there are certain problems in the market mechanism that, that, enable, that mean that there's no guarantee that everybody's going to get a job or no guarantee that anybody can, can obtain a job that, that is well paying enough to bring up a family. So that, that welfare state was originally um, thought of as providing that sort of safety net mechanism. And then the arguments around health and education are a little gets a little bit more blurred, depending upon um, how close to the textbook you want the government to, to operate. And there are those who believe that the health and education system is yet just another good or service that the private sector or the market should provide, and the government should be only stepping in when the market mm. is not there. Um, I probably wouldn't go that far, and I would actually say the government has a has a strong role to play in definitely in health and education because. Um, if you don't look after the health and, and the schooling and the education of, of the community of society, then the economy itself is not going to prosper because you're not going to have um, skilled people take, available to take up these jobs. You're not going to have healthy people available to take up these jobs. So there's, it's very much, a, in my opinion, a two-way relationship between the economy and the health of the society rather than seeing them as, as uh, separate from each other. And, and that's where things get a bit blurred and that's where you get economists arguing against each other about how far government should go. Because uh, I mean, it feels sometimes that, that, that we've become, as, as families and as people, we sort of always think the state's going to be there as a safety net, you know, the, the state will provide for, for everything we need. Should we be more self-reliant? Well, I'm not sure about self-reliant, but we do have to get a, a beyond this idea that the state's always going to be there. We have to look at the safety net and I had no problems with the safety net, but I think in certain areas the safety net has, has become just far too broad for what it should be doing. And, and the problems with that, from not just from an economist perspective, but from a social perspective, it doesn't send all the signals about participating in society to your utmost potential. You're, you're sort of putting off that responsibility and you're trying to... There are those who will take that free ride if available to them. And that's where you get the, the safety net becoming a lot broader and a lot more expensive and to cut to the chase if the safety net becomes a lot more uh, too expensive as it has in New Zealand at the moment then there's just not 
the funds or the resources available for the, the schools and the hospitals and those other things that are, are probably, in my opinion, a lot more valuable and a lot more um, necessary for not just um, the needs of community and the society, but the needs of the economy and the nation as a whole. Because in the end, I guess, there's only so much cake and if you've used too much of the cake, there are no slices left for... Exactly, the, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's part of the problem. The Part of the other problem is if we too much put too much effort on that safety net, well, then we neglect to put the effort into actually building the size of the cake, growing the size of the cake, because if we continue to argue over where the slices go, we forget the big story, and the big story is how do we actually make that cake grow? Because the only way that New Zealand is actually going to uh, provide for its community, for its people, for its society, provide the opportunities for the future generations, is to actually grow that cake because at the moment it is too small um, and we'll continue to squabble over who gets what share and we won't, in the end, we won't be providing the opportunities for future generations. Realistically though, is that ever going to happen because our politicians are really pretty much focused on, on the next election which is only ever three years or so away? Well, depends on how cynical you are and how pessimistic <laughs> you are. Um, I suppose sitting here in 2011 when we've just come off the back of a a fairly um, grim period in, in terms of economic prospects and, and yes we haven't made very much progress in many of the community and social problems facing New Zealand it seems it seems like a pessimistic time but um, I always go back to um, our forefathers and our parents before us and our grandparents before us they built this nation and they also had a three-year election cycle but what we were I suppose I'm not sure about gifted with but what we had was a a community and a social and a leadership mindset that actually did look beyond the here and now and did look beyond the th next three years and, and, did it, and, and it was an open target um, a, and an optimistic target maybe but part of the targets or the goals of economic, social and community pro policies were to build a nation, were to build a future for our next generation and I think that's what's been lost over the past few years. And I think that's what we've got to reinstill in, inside in New Zealanders in terms of whether it's this election cycle or maybe the next, but we've actually got get to go beyond the what's in it for me. And I know that there are some families who definitely have to think about what's in it for me, but, but for, we've got to go beyond that and actually start questioning our leaders and asking, OK, you, you're telling us about the recession, you're telling us about the next year, but I'm interested in what's in it for my kids and for my grandkids, you know, what we said opportunities. We've heard all these stories before, we've heard them over the past decades about how we're going to catch Australia or how we're going to provide all of this um, extra income or how we're going to um, provide all these resources into hospitals and schools, but stop pulling the wool over our eyes. We know New Zealand can't afford it in our current, the current way we're doing things. So we've got to go beyond that. We've got to do something different. And I think that's where we're looking for some form of courageous leader whether it's a politician or a social leader, community leader, business leader, I use leadership in, a, in the broader sense. Until we get into that sort of discussion, we're going to continue this three-year election cycle and this, this very short-term thinking, which is going to take, in, in an economic context, continue the stumbling from crisis to crisis, whether the crisis is our, our, own, our own fault or from somewhere abroad, we're going to continue stumbling on that and we're not really going to make serious progress on any of the economic, let alone the community and social issues it faces. Let's hold that thought for a minute because we'll come back and talk some more in just a couple of moments. And welcome back. Our election issue this week is the economy. My guest is Bill, senior economist, Dr Ganesh Nana. Ganesh, before the break, we were talking about this, this whole short-term vision and about mm -hmm. having a, a, a longer-term vision. Back in 1960, only one person in 50 was on a benefit but in 2008, and this was before the credit crunch, that figure was more like one in 10. So is that what's changed? It's that, that we don't have that longer term vision anymore? I, th I think that's partly it. I mean, I, the part of it, that part of the difference in those statistics is that broadening of the government's role and that, that broadening of that safety net. And we can argue over about whether it's too broad or whether that one in 50 was too narrow. Um, but I think the, it's a symptom of what's wrong and I'm not saying that all of those people on the benefit should be taken off the benefit because clearly there is a role for a safety net but I think it's got too broad and what we're getting now is that that's just um, encouraging this debate about um, have we got too many beneficiaries or how we've got too many on benefit and it's just open, um, it's open and it can be just uh, uh, 
provides the impetus for that sort of that short-term debate that doesn't go get us anywhere. We know well, government needs to stop spending, so let's spend let's stop spending on the easiest thing there is to stop spending, or let's just um, think about those benefits and, and and cut those. And and it's it's not a very um, profitable discussion or debate. And again, it's just reinforcing that short-term argument, and, and you hear it no doubt in other areas around. We've got to stop spending, and we've got to save more. And to me, that's just reinforcing that short-term negative thinking, where we've actually got to start turning that debate around. There's, just, there's actually another way of thinking about it. And the real problem with New Zealand economy, and the the population and the way we re and interact with the New Zealand economy is not that we don't save and it's not that we spend too much. New Zealand's problem is that we don't earn enough. It's as simple as that. And the simplest solution, and it's not the easy one, but the, the most um, direct solution that will go a long way to solving most of New Zealand's economic and not to mention social and community problems is if we focus on earning, focus on lifting New Zealand's incomes and then we can actually start arguing about how we spend it and how we cut up the pie and, and, and how we save it. But until we get beyond that, until we're going to continue to talk about how we don't save and how we spend too much, and the reason we don't save is because we don't earn enough. And to me, I have serious problems with commentators like myself, and I never make the comment, <laughs> but other commentators who are on um, probably six-figure salaries telling a family on 50000 that they don't save enough and they should spend less. To me, I have no credibility making that statement, and I don't. The problem is that they don't earn enough, and we've got to set up an economy, a business sector and a community with um, uh, that, that is focused on high-paying jobs, skilled jobs, and businesses that are here for the long term, offering those sorts of jobs that will enable us to afford to pay New Zealanders a wage and an income that will enable them to earn a living that gives them the opportunities that most of us take as our birthright. You know, we live in New Zealand and we take, had, had, had it handed down from us, from our parents, that there are all these things in front of us. Unfortunately, the world has changed, and while it might have been our grandparents' birthright, unfortunately it's not ours. We have to earn it now, and, and we seriously risk losing it if we don't understand that we have to start earning this lifestyle that we believe is ours. So how do you do that? Because it, it's... That's a that's a huge it's, it's a, a huge, huge shift. It's a huge leap. It's it's a, again around shifting our economic policy focus. Our, our focus is, is currently around how do we balance the budget, how do we cut government spending, and how do we encourage savings. We want to shift that focus to the one target, which is lifting our incomes. And for me, and I don't want to get too technical, but for me, how do we lift New Zealand's incomes is, is to lift our export income. And that's our businesses that are able to compete with the rest of the world, because that's how we bring income into New Zealand. We sell the things that we are good at making, and we sell those things to people abroad who are willing to pay for it. And that, that's where I think New Zealand is in, the best, is in a good frame. There are lots of opportunities, because New Zealand does possess a lot of the resources that the rest of the world want. And bluntly, it's called food and water. Mm. And the rest of the world want food and water, and New Zealand has got all of that. And um, if New Zealand and New Zealanders can't make it in the world where we're abundant with food and water, then to be blunt, we don't deserve the lifestyle we take for granted here. And we've got to get beyond that, and we've got to get building businesses, encouraging businesses that can compete with the rest of the world, that can compete on export terms, because then they will be offering those high-skilled jobs, those high-paying opportunities for New Zealanders. So, again, how do we do that? How do we... Is it, a cha is it on an individual basis? Are we as individuals responsible for that? Or, or Individuals, communities and government. We all have to be in this boat together. We all have to be responsible. How do we do it in a nutshell? Um, it's long-term. But we have to be prepared to invest, and economists call it investment, you can call it spending, but we have to be prepared to invest in, for the future, and that means investment in education and training, so that people have the skills to take up these new opportunities, investment in entrepreneurship, investment in um, the infrastructure, whether that's, whether that's roads or whether that's transport or whether that's broadband communication or electricity or power. Um, all of those sorts, or investment in marketing, in sales, or in research and development, or in science, all of those things we've heard about a lot, and um, policy officials say uh, write a lot of reports about these things, but we don't actually do it. 
and those things are big decisions because if we're serious about it, we have to be prepared to spend a lot on those things and not so much on these other things that we continue to argue about. And, and that's where the concern is. Whenever the, if we're focused on cutting government spending or whether it's businesses focusing on cutting spending, the first thing they usually cut is training budgets or spending on their staff. Or if it's government, well, let's cut some, uh, let's cut some tra training spending of, of the um, polytechnics or maybe even the universities or science and R&D. And, and, and those, is, those sorts of cuts are easy to make in the short term because they balance the budget in the short term, but the longer term the complications of those mean we are forever in this cycle of low income, low, e low economic prospects and low wages. I'm trapped in the studio with a man who's preaching revolution. We'll take a break and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Welcome back to our election special on the economy. My guest is Dr. Ganesh Nana. We've talked a little bit about how we aspire to what Australia has. Do we as a, as a nation, do we tend to look to other people, other economies like Australia or the UK or the USA and say, that's what we want to do? Is, is, that, is that a good thing to do? Um, probably not. I mean, we, we should be old enough as a nation, as a people, to actually set our own aspirations. Um, and it is a, it's a question, or it's, a, it's a marker of our own uh, maturity as to whether we are, um, feel confident enough to set our own targets and set our own um, goals. And I think that, that's, that's probably critical. And, and I think for too long we, it's easy to pick a target that's somewhere far away. Let's pick another country and let's see if we can um, meet that. But I think we, we should be confident enough. I mean, I, it is a question of what, what do we want out of out of our economy, out of our country, out of our, our communities. And I think we um, have a lot of um, advantages here in New Zealand that are different from a lot of other countries. And, and um, we talk about them a lot. We feel a little bit uncomfortable trying to sell them whenever it happens to be uh, the clean green image or whatever it is. Um, but underneath all of that, there is quite a, 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 um, a different... Um, prospects or different climate here in New Zealand that, that would mean that we probably should have different targets. And, and me as an economist, now I get criticised as our, the target is always lifting incomes or lifting, you know, lifting um, dollars. But to me, the dollars is a means to an end. We lift incomes. Why? Not because I'm just interested in getting more dollars. It's because those dollars then enable us to provide opportunities to build New Zealand to, for future opportunities, either for future generations or for um, the the lifestyle that we have in New Zealand, whether that's looking after the environment or um, providing high school jobs or providing um, the best educational institutions or the mo best health care or all of those sorts of things that I know my parents thought was, was here as of right and we thought we always had them. But we, in the last few years, surely has taught New Zealanders that we, we can't take those for granted and we need um, some targets out there, and if they are first world health care, then that's fine, that's a good target for me to go for. But the only way to get that, sp speaking to me as an economist, is to make sure that we earn the incomes to, um, to afford that sort of health care. You can understand, though, can't you, when people look across the Tasman, I mean, I've got friends who've, who've emigrated to Australia because they look across and they say, oh, hey, look, you know, exactly. I, yeah. my income is higher. I've got more opportunities there. Exactly. New Zealand's too small is usually the third part of that equation. I don't necessarily agree with it, but it's what is commonly said, isn't it? It depends what you mean by New Zealand is too small. Um, but it, and, and that's one of those targets or that's one of those um, things that New Zealand does need to talk about because there are costs involved in, in terms of economic costs, and I would then also argue in terms of all of those other things, around New Zealand being as small as it is. And if we're clever enough, we could grow New Zealand to just a little bit bigger than it currently is, but maintain the lifestyle that we've got here. Because I can understand, but that's a debate and a discussion we've got to have. Because if, to me, if New Zealand was a lot bigger in terms of people than it currently has, then that enables us to afford those other, um, th those first world healthcare or educational institutes or even the lifestyle a lot easier. That just makes those a lot more, in an economic sense, a lot more um, sustainable. Unfortunately, at a population of four million, 
um, those sorts of things are just a lot more difficult to provide for. And you're talking about um, cancer wards, uh, dedicated cancer wards in a hospital in Dunedin. Those things are a lot more difficult to provide on a, glo on a, on a New Zealand population of 4 million. And, and those are the sorts of those blunt questions and blunt issues that unfortunately we have to debate, we have to discuss and have to make decisions about because um, New Zealand is in, unfortunately, is not in a state to say you will have all of it. It'd be nice to say we, have, we could have all of it, but unfortunately we can't and we have to make those decisions and unfortunately those decisions are, are going to be more difficult to make the longer we put off those decisions and those discussions and debates. You look across America and you see a society which seems to have the majority of the wealth is concentrated in a, a relatively small, allegedly expert group of, of people who make the decisions. Do we have a tendency to, to go that way? Should we be looking at a, a society that is, that is more even? What, what, when we're as small as we are, like you said, we shouldn't be looking at a huge society. We shouldn't be looking at a huge society. One of, one of the, I suppose one of the lifestyles and one of the values that many New Zealanders, I won't say take for granted, but definitely value is, is around that, that um, the, level, the levelness of the, the income distribution. And we can argue about how, whether it's got wider or over the last few years. Um, but again, we have, to make, we have to discuss these things openly or debate them openly for, for too long with we've swept those under the carpet and we've been too afraid to talk about those things, many of those things, because we have taken them for granted. Um, I would definitely argue for, a, for an economy that's built on opportunities for all, and so that we do have a, a proactive role for government in ensuring that there are opportunities across the whole of the, the social spectrum. But again, um, whether I would openly say that we should have a, a target for an even income distribution, maybe not because we definitely do have to um, reward, I won't say reward, uh, yeah, we do have to reward high skills. We have to reward entrepreneurship. We have to reward um, businesses and societies and community leaders who are willing to take risks and provide those opportunities for everybody. But that does not necessarily mean a, 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 in a community that's, um, uh, <coughs> that, that is like the US that has income distribution. I mean, somewhere in the middle, we, and I suppose that's, that, that's, that's the ideal. We, we need to strike that balance between an economy that is, so to that is totally focused on income at the top end versus one that's more balanced but still provides those incentives um, and incentives for skills, incentives for high pay, um, and incentives to take risks. Okay, we're nearly out of time, but the, the $64 million question, when those politicians rock, rock up to your front door and are campaigning to be our governors for the next three years, what should be the question that we ask them? What I'd ask them what they were going to do after the three years has ended, because <laughs> I'm not interested in the next three years. Um, I'd be asking them what are they going to do for the next 10 years, and if they're not going to commit for that minimal period of time, then I'd say I'm not interested in them. And, and what are they going to do to um, lift New Zealand's incomes? Are they interested in the, the spending debate, or are they seriously interested in the income debate? Because that's, that's the big difference. Are they interested in looking to the future or just patching over the, the problems of the past? It's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so Thank you. much Pleasure. for your time. My guest on the programme, Dr Ganesh Nana, has uh, been talking about the economy. We hope you've enjoyed our series of programmes looking at the role of the government in providing its citizens with life essentials. Well, hopefully we've given you some food for thought, some questions to ask as we come up to this year's election. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Bye for now.